I'm excited for tonight because, because we have uh, the privilege tonight of acknowledging the work of God in the life of somebody that we love a lot. And so I'm going to explain a little bit about what we're going to do tonight, but we're going to go to God first in prayer. Father, we love you. Lord, we're so thankful for tonight. And uh, who are we? God, who are we that you would even, that you'd even include us? In your work, it is a miracle that you would use faulty vessels such as us. God, that you would entrust the most amazing message, the gospel of Jesus, your son, that you would entrust that to us. God, that we would be vessels of your Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, our minds could have never conceived that you would create the church as your tool to reach the lost world with your gospel, and that, God, in your church, you would raise up leaders and servants and pastors and missionaries and evangelists and worship leaders. And, Father, we thank you that you do this. It's it's just an honor. It's a privilege. And, God, you know our hearts. We're not here to play church. This church doesn't play church. God, we take your work very seriously. God, we acknowledge that we're living in the last days. Lord, we want to be busy about our Father's business. God, we, we rejoice together when someone among us is raised up for the work of the ministry. God, you know our hearts. There's no jealousy or contempt. God, we are so excited to see what you do here in this, your church. And God, we pray tonight specifically that you would bless Tony and Nikki. God, that your mighty hand of blessing would be all over their lives. And Father, that you would be speaking to them, God, that you would be preparing them and training them. God, for Tony, that you'd be pouring out wisdom into his heart and his his mind as you've given this high calling to him. We pray, God, for your spiritual protection around their lives. Father, I pray that as we see what you're doing tonight, that there would be a mutual love that we would share. God, you would use this night to knit our hearts together more and more as your children, and even as this body grows numerically, God, we pray that we would not grow apart, but that we would grow together, and that you would keep us knit together with bands of loving kindness. And Father, I pray also tonight that as we see one raised up from among us, that God, there'd be something that you would do tonight in this place, that your Holy Spirit would have the freedom tonight to move and to speak a calling upon whoever in this room may be being called, maybe as a missionary, maybe to teach your word, maybe into the children's ministry, maybe to serve in some capacity ministering to the poor in this community. Father, we pray that that there would be a work. We are open to it, God. We are open to it. I pray that what happens tonight would provoke us to good works, God, to press out Uh, Lord, to step past the boundaries that we so often place in our lives that restrict you from doing what you want to do. God, we don't want that kind of life. And so, Father, we pray tonight that you'd just move among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I do love this. Obviously, you can tell that uh, in, when I pray, I get excited about this stuff. And um, honestly, for me, it is, it is one of those things that, uh, you know, It's amazing that God even allows us to be involved in his work. It is a total miracle. And you know, in the book of Revelation, the Bible says that God is going to raise up two witnesses. Most likely, well, we know one is Elijah, the other one, Enoch or or Moses. God is going to send four angels to the four corners of the world to preach the gospel. He He could have done it like that after the resurrection, but he didn't. He chose to use us which is an absolute miracle because we know each other, right? I mean, there's no, there's total transparency here. It's a, it's a miracle that God chooses to use us. And, and so when someone among us is raised up uh, for the work of the ministry, I take great joy in that because I know it's the will of God. You may be new tonight to the church and and so, you know, maybe this is your first time here. You've kind of stepped into uh, something that's out of the ordinary. You know, we're normally working our way verse by verse through the Word of God. We're in Micah um, on Sunday nights. 
Um, but I'm glad you're here. I believe it's ordained by God because, um, you know, I think it's important for us to be reminded what it means to be a pastor and what a pastoral calling is. I remember the first time I met Tony. Uh, I remember exactly where I was at. We were at the Bible College for a senior pastor's conference, and, you know, I've known Nikki for a long time. And so Nikki says, hey, uh, she was going to school there, I want you to meet my boyfriend. And so, you know, little skeptical, little skeptical, I have to confess, we were in the coffee shop, and uh, there's Tony, and I can still see his face today. The first thing that struck me about Tony was his smile. I mean, Tony has got the biggest smile. And immediately, I'm like, I like this guy. You know, this guy, not only do I like him, I want to hire him. <laughs> so Tony and Nikki were graduating, and uh, God was stirring my heart uh, for both of them to come back and to serve here at the church. And so that's what happened. We hired both of them. Tony served as an intern. He worked in facilities. Um, he was part of the worship team. You guys have seen this, right? I mean, you have seen what God has done in their lives. He was part of the worship team. Now he's one of our lead worship leaders. He oversees the Dulas ministry. There's so many things that uh, God has been doing in Tony and Nikki's life. It's just, it's been an amazing thing to watch. But it's not just what, and by the way, this is not Tony night tonight, okay? I'm just affirming something tonight. Um, it's not just what God does through Tony's life. It's his love for God. You know, that's really um, I know that if we were all to write down some of the things that we appreciate the most, number one would be his love for God, number two would be his love for people. You know, I mean, it, it pours through. I appreciate Tony's work ethic. He works really hard, and I will never ordain somebody who does not have a, a work ethic uh, for a pastor because you cannot serve God as a pastor successfully if you don't have a very serious work ethic. And I see this in Tony's life. I see humility. I see a, a humble heart. And so tonight is, this is what tonight is about. Tonight is about us affirming, right? This is what it means to ordain. There is an affirmation. We are acknowledging the calling of God in a person's life, all right? We're, we're saying, hey, you know what? I see that. I affirm that. Can we all affirm that tonight? All right, we affirm that. It's affirmed. Let it be affirmed. Um, in addition to that, this is not just a formality tonight, um, and it's not just an affirmation. There is, I believe, as I study the New Testament, there is a transferring of authority here as well, going all the way back to the authority that Christ gave the original disciples. And so as we ordain, there is something unique that God does. There's something, that power, something powerful that God does uh, in the ordination process. It's not just an acknowledging, it's not certainly a formality, uh, there is also a transferring of authority. There's a unique work of God's Holy Spirit. He is going to meet us here in this place as uh, God, it, God is affirming, as God is affirming that this is the calling for Tony's life to serve as a pastor. In Mark chapter 3, I just want you to notice a couple of things tonight. Mark chapter 3, and uh, after the service tonight, listen, I, I want you all, we're going to end kind of early this evening. We've got... Um, we have got a reception set up, I believe, in the coffee shop. I really, please, I'm asking you guys to hang out tonight, fellowship with each other, and encourage Tony and Nikki in what God is doing in their lives. Um, in Mark chapter 3, I wanted to read this tonight to you. The Bible says in verse 13, And he went up, he being Jesus, and he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. I love that. And they came to him. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. And then uh, from verse 16 on, it enumerates the 12 disciples. I want you to notice some things here as we're talking about a person being appointed or ordained to the work of the ministry as a pastor. Number one is this. Jesus went up to the mountain and he spent time in prayer with the Father. And he chose. It, the Bible says that he called uh, to him those he himself wanted. The work of a pastor is not a vocation, it is a calling. Uh, it is not a job, it's an adventure. No, I'm just kidding, I just wanted to throw that in. It is an adventure. It is an adventure. Uh, it is not a vocation, all right? You're not, 
you're not punching your card, keeping hours on a clock. Uh, it is a calling on, on your life. Tony, it's a calling on your life. You're a husband, you're a son, you're a pastor also. The gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Uh, it's not just that, hey, I spend 40 hours a week being a pastor, and then the rest of the time I have to myself. No, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this is a calling that God has for you in your life. This certainly was how the Apostle Paul viewed his calling. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Those were the words that he said. And I believe what's true for Paul the Apostle is true for you tonight, Tony, as well. I love that Jesus selected those who he wanted. All right, this is not an ordination by the hand of man. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. He selects those he wants. And so the amazing thing here, Tony, which is so encouraging, is that it's not that I've selected you. It's not that the board of directors has selected you. It's not that a group of pastors or elders has selected you. God has selected you. Jesus has chosen you for this very thing, which has got to be so encouraging for you tonight. I mean, just think about the picture. Jesus saying, that's my man right there. That is my man. Uh, and you know, as a pastor, there are going to be times in your life where you have to remind yourself of that. Okay, wait a minute. All right, it's not that I just got appointed to this by man. This is something that Christ has done in my life. So it's a calling, not a vocation. It is a privilege. To serve as a pastor is a privilege. Uh, there is no high, this is my personal opinion, there is no higher calling in the world than to serve as a pastor. To be able to represent God to people, to be able to preach and teach the word of God, to be able to love the people of God, to be able to lead the people of God is a great privilege. In fact, Paul said this in Timothy. He said, he who desires the position of a bishop or an elder desires a good work. It is a good thing. It is a privileged, a high and holy calling. The third thing is this. It's a blessing, not a burden. It's a blessing, not a burden. Sometimes um, as pastors progress in the ministry, sometimes if we're not careful, we begin to lean on our own strength, we begin to lean on our, our own wisdom, which is never good for a pastor. Ultimately, it leads a man to a place where the calling is no longer a blessing, it is a burden. And sometimes I hear this from my pastor friends, and it's a warning to me when I see this, it's a reminder for me to make sure that my eyes are set on the Lord and not on myself. Tony, I want to encourage you that this calling, as difficult as it's going to be, there are going to be times where you are so challenged. There are going to be deep valleys that God is going to intentionally take you through to do a work in your heart so that you can join in the fellowship of his sufferings. C.H. Spurgeon was on vacation with his wife. They'd gone to a church. This young pastor was preaching, and afterwards, amazing preaching, Afterwards, his wife said, you know what? That was one of the best messages I've ever heard. That man is anointed. And Spurgeon said he'll be more anointed after he suffers. And this is the calling of a pastor. While it's a great blessing, God will allow you the great privilege of joining in the fellowship of his sufferings. And even in those times, you know, and I think that David said this so clearly, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil why was there no fear? Because you are with me. And so you cling to the presence of God in your life. Some people have said to me, Pastor, you know what? You must have been so close to God. That's why God picked you and chose you to be a pastor. Because, because you walk so closely to him. And Tony, I would remind us tonight that Jesus did not choose the cream of the crop. All right? I know this is... You're like, wow, that's really encouraging. Thank you. <laughs> Blessed. But he didn't go to the rabbinical schools. You know, he didn't go to Jerusalem, and he didn't go to the Sanhedrin, and he didn't say to them, hey, you know what? Um, I've, I've come to establish my kingdom. I'm the Messiah. Who are the, who, who's the cream of the crop here? Let me see the test scores. Who's the brightest? Who's the smartest? Who's the most intellectual? Who's the most charismatic? Who's got the biggest personality? Who's got the deepest theology? Because those are the men I want to select. He didn't do that. He went and did the exact opposite. He picked a tax collector. He picked a political zealot. He picked four uneducated fishermen. He picked a dreamer, all right? He didn't pick, 
And normally, especially in Calvary Chapel, what you'll notice is that he doesn't pick the cream of the crop. He takes those things that are not to bring to nothing those things that are. Now, I want you to think about the Apostle Paul. You know, sometimes we have this picture of him. He penned two-thirds of the New Testament, this amazing man, this church planter, this missionary. I mean, this guy did so much for God. But remember, before he did any of that, what was he? He, he was a Pharisee. He was a persecutor of the church. While he was on his way, think about this, while he was on his way to persecute I shared this at the missions conference a couple of weeks ago. While he was on his way to persecute the church, not only did Christ save him, but simultaneously Christ gave him his calling. Paul's calling happened while he was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. And, and this is what God does in our lives. You know, Paul never forgot that. As, as mightily as Paul was used. Paul never forgot the pit that God pulled him from. And Tony, I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, as pastors, you know, God is going to use your life. God is already using your life. God is doing great things. God has greater things than even these. But as God multiplies your investment and expands his kingdom, you can never forget that it's always him. You always need to remember where he has pulled you from, the work he's done in your life, and that will always be for you an anchor for humility. Paul said this in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He said, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul never forgot that it was the Lord who did this in his life. And as he remembered the pit that Christ pulled him out of, it was for him, as I said, an anchor for humility. This thing that God is doing in your life, it is a thing of God and not of man, as I mentioned earlier. And I think this is important because... Uh, you are going to need to remind yourself when things do get difficult that this is God's calling on your life. For you to step out of his calling on your life would be disobedience. So it works like this. You do what God has called you to do because you're an obedient servant to him. And anything less than that would be disobedience. You can't be driven because of your emotions. You can't be driven because of the fruit that God is blessing your ministry with. You do what you do because you're an obedient servant. And as you do, God is going to give you everything that you need. I love what Paul said uh, in 1 Timothy in verse 12. He said, I thank Christ our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Think about the sovereignty of God in that. Paul is recounting what Christ did in his life. I thank Christ our Lord, he says, who has enabled. That word enabled means to be empowered he is the one who's empowering you. Paul says, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. This is what you have to bring. You have a love for God, you have faith in God, and you have a surrendered life. That's what you bring into the ministry. And as you bring that to him, and you, as you place that into his hands, God is going to do a great thing in your life. But you need to stay in a constant state of dependence upon him. I would say that not only for Tony tonight. I would say that for all of us this evening. We need to maintain in our lives a constant state of dependence on God. You know what? You can create a little world of convenience where you don't even need God. It's not that you don't love God. It's not that you don't have faith in God. But in this culture that we live in of great convenience, you can create a little world of convenience where while you do love God, you have no need to really trust in Him. You know, God wants to take those walls that we build in our lives. He wants to blow them away and lead us to a place where we're, where we're walking uh, not by sight but by faith. Tonight, we need to be fully dependent on God for all things, whether we're serving as a pastor or whether we're serving in some other capacity. This is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 
he says, just concerning how Christ is our sufficiency, he said, we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Are you guys tracking with this tonight? Who also made, check this out, this is so good. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter of the law, but of grace. And so Paul says this, look, at, we know what the deal is here. Uh, this, is, this doesn't take rocket science. We are simply vessels, and our sufficiency is of God. Nothing comes from us. Everything that God does for his kingdom ultimately is something that he is simply doing through our lives. And listen, Tony, as he does this through your life, make sure all of the glory always goes to God, all right? Make sure all of the glory always goes to God because God will share his glory with nobody. And so you'll have opportunities. I, I love what... I love what Corrie Ten Boom used to do. You know, she was so mightily used by God after World War II just to bring healing to the nation of Germany and Europe. She would preach the message of the gospel. People would get saved. There were so many people that would come up to her and just talk to her about how God was mightily using her. She said at the end of every day, right, this is what she would do. She would collect those compliments like flowers at the end of every day, she would put them together in a bouquet, and she would present them to God. I love that, you know, and we need to make sure we're doing that in our lives. You know, I think we all know this, that pride is one of the greatest traps for pastors and people in ministry, as God can be using a person's life powerfully if a person's not careful, they begin to think, they begin to live under self-deception, thinking that it's in fact themselves who are responsible for all of these things that are happening. And we need to remember that when something great is being done by God, it's not us, it's the Lord. I shared this this morning. We had the privilege of buying chairs for uh, Calvary Chapel Vida Nueva. And so, you know, hard plastic chairs. I, and I, I said this today. You know, in this culture, if we had these chairs in this church, there'd be people that would come in and they would say, Pastor, where's the padding? All right? Okay? God has given us plenty of padding. In this culture, people would possibly think, well, I'm not going to that church because of those chairs. In that culture, as we said to this pastor, hey, God has stirred our hearts. We're going to spend 2,500 bucks. We're going to, we just want to bless you with these chairs. You know what he did? He started crying. He started weeping. He was so overwhelmed. He was so overwhelmed that we would demonstrate this type of love. And he said to me, thank you. Pastor, thank you so much. I said, stop. This is not me. This is not this missions team. This is not our church. This is God. This is how much God loves you. So, Tony and Nikki, I want to encourage you, when God does a work and the compliment comes, give praise to God. Even if it sounds like a cliche, even if, even if someone says, well, everyone says praise the Lord, who cares? Let's praise the Lord anyway, and let's give him all of the glory, because he deserves it. <laughs> Tony, my prayer for you is that you would be like the burning bush that drew Moses' attention, that your life would be filled with the power of God, that your life would be filled with the presence of God and that as people see what God is doing in your life, they would be drawn aside to seek the face of God. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians as well. He says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. And this is the point that no flesh should glory in his presence. And so I want to encourage you tonight, both of you, to give glory to God. We give glory to God for all that he's done in your life. I want to encourage the congregation tonight. I want to encourage you guys to appreciate the leadership in the ministry. For these people that serve on staff, all right, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about our ministry team. And they would never say this to you, but these people pour their hearts out for the kingdom of God. And they work uh, tirelessly for 
the work of God's kingdom and for you, that you would be blessed. I want to encourage you. You know, it's important from time to time to come alongside of the worship leaders and the pastors and the administrators and our facilities team and to say, hey, you know what? I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for what God is doing in your life. There's a whole group of people that come in and set this uh, chapel up and they clean this chapel and they prepare it for you. And you know, it's a blessing for them to be able to do that. But sometimes it's nice to be able to take a moment and say, you know, I'm affirming tonight. I know that this doesn't just happen. And so stop and take a second, talk to the facilities team, talk to the pastors, and just encourage them for what God is doing in and through their lives. So Tony and Nikki, tonight we're just affirming what God is doing. We see his mighty hand on your life. Um, I, I want to say this, that, um, you know, we acknowledge tonight, Tony, your love for God and your love for people. Nikki, we acknowledge your love for God and your love for people too. And it, it would be impossible for me tonight to lay my hands on Tony and ordain him as a pastor if he wasn't married to somebody who comp wouldn't compliment his calling. And Nikki compliments the calling of God on Tony's life. She serves alongside of her husband and she supports him and she encourages him. They are a ministry team. And that's what God has called us to be as husbands and wives, whether we're serving as pastors or not. God has called us to be uh, ministry team if we're married. And Tony and Nikki, I think that um, as you consider these things, I've shared a lot of scripture tonight. I'd encourage you just to take some of these scriptures and meditate on them and, and memorize them. The bottom line is this, you know, there are so many worldly methods out there right now that people are being encouraged to use to evaluate the success of a ministry. And unfortunately, we're in that place, I think, as a church nationally, where the world has gotten such a foothold that people in ministry are now being taught to evaluate the success of their ministry by worldly criteria. I want to give you the criteria for evaluating success. They're the words of Christ. Well done, good and faithful servant. All right? That's what you want to hear. That's what you want to hear one day. You want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So the criteria is this. Number one, you're a doulos. All right? The two of you together are plural, so it's, it's douloi. So you're Duloy tonight. Make your own shirt, okay, or your own beanie. Um, but this is the criteria that as servants of God, you are good, which means, you know, God is referring to the quality of your character, and you are faithful, which refers to uh, the quality of what you do for him and the faithfulness that you have in, in doing the work of the ministry that he's called you to. And I think that as you keep this as your goal, this is your North Star, all right? Good and faithful servant. As this is your North Star, God is going to cause all of the things that you do for him to prosper for the kingdom of God. And I believe with all of my heart uh, that we're just seeing the beginning of God's great work in your lives. I'm very thankful for that. So tonight, I'm going to have Tony and Nikki come up. Tony's going to share a couple of words tonight. Um, and so why don't you guys welcome them up. <laughs> What's happening, homies? Well, uh, I'm so blessed to be here. Words are, are just uh, fleeting my mind right now. They're, I'm just uh, super blessed is the best way I can describe it tonight. And uh, um, I wanted to kind of give you guys a little background about, uh, you know, getting to this, this point in my life. And, and uh, um, I, the prayer tonight is that I can make it through. I'm a weeper, just to let you guys know. So... Uh, um, I'm not ashamed to say that, but um, I think I can make it through. Whew. So, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, when I was uh, when I was in high school, 
God really took a hold of my heart um, at, in my, my youth group and, and, uh, um, and really, um, you know, captured my heart when, at a young age. And, and uh, I got the privilege and the honor to be able to serve with my family in music and to serve alongside my family in music. We got to travel the world together and, and play at a lot of different, uh, different churches and, and uh, youth groups and, and things like that with my, my mom and my dad. And, and uh, um, that's where I fell in love with music. That's where I fell in love with worship music. I played drums for for them and and uh, um, I, I remember uh, after the the years of doing it, I remember thinking I I, I got back and we finished our last uh, our last like tour or whatever you you call it and and uh, we got back and I thought I told my my family I said man I, I want to do this for the rest of my life I want to minister to people for the rest of my life I really feel that that is what God is calling me to do and and I remember on uh, on those trips God really uh, um, laid on my heart to go to Bible college and uh, to to pursue ministry and to pursue ministering, uh, you know, uh, um, to people and, and to serve God the rest of my life. And uh, um, I remember uh, when, when I went off to Bible college, my parents told me that one of the last things they, they encouraged me with was uh, uh, to make sure after I graduate to get plugged in immediately into a, a solid church to, to raise me up and to minister to me and to disciple me along the way in, in, in what God was calling me to do. And uh, I, I couldn't ask for a better church church to be a part of. I couldn't ask for a better church family to be raised in, and uh, um, you guys have been so gracious to me and to my family, to my wife and I, and so loving to us, and and uh, you guys have showed me so much grace and uh, and all the different things and my mistakes and and uh, the the amazing things we get to do together. And it's been a privilege. It's been a privilege to serve alongside of all of you. I've learned so much serving alongside of each and every one of you guys. And and. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the love and support I've gotten from all of you has been so overwhelming and such a blessing blessing to me. And, and uh, I, I know I, I talk to my friends and, and uh, you know, some of them have served in ministry, some have not. And, and they're, they're like, man, what, what makes you stay in Las Vegas? <laughs> like, uh, you know, in, in Seattle, we've got a lot of crazy things. We've got colors in Seattle. Um, <laughs> and uh, things like that, um, but uh, um, they've got the Seahawks who won today, a crazy game. Sorry, I had to throw that in there for my dad. But um, uh, they, they've asked me, man, what, what, is, what, what has kept you there? And I'm like, man, th this ministry, what God is doing in this ministry is unlike any other I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, you know... I remember, uh, I remember talking to Pastor Derek after service not too long ago, and he was talking about what if, what if uh, the great revival started here in Las Vegas? And I remember, uh, I remember thinking after he said that, like, I've heard that a lot. Like, I've gone to a lot of conferences, I've gone to a lot of different things, and I've heard that. What if the great revival started here or started there? And, but it, like, hit me in a weird way, and I was like, it really could. <laughs> it's crazy how, how amazing the Lord is working through this ministry and what he's doing through each and every one of you guys. And, and it's a blessing being here. And I've been so grateful for Pastor Derek's leadership. This guy, uh, um, you know, uh, the backstory of what, the, the time I got to meet him for the first time, I remember very well as well. And... Uh, Walking in, uh, uh, you know, I thought it was very odd that, that my, my, uh, my girlfriend at the time wanted me to introduce me to her senior pastor. I was thinking maybe youth pastor, maybe worship pastor, but the senior pastor, I thought, man, what a cool relationship that she has a relationship with her senior pastor in such a way that she wants to, like, introduce me to him and, uh, and things like that. And the first time I got to meet him, I understood why. And uh, just the relationship, the, the, how relational pastor Derek is, and, uh, um, and not only is he my pastor, not only is he my mentor, my leader, but he's my friend, and I love that.
I'm so grateful for his grace for me, because <laughs> I've made a lot of mistakes, and I'm very grateful for his grace towards me. It, it truly exemplifies the grace of Christ, and uh, there have been so many times when, when I got here uh, that I wanted to give up. I'll be honest with you. There were times way at the beginning when I first moved here that, man, I wanted to give up, and, and I was like, man, what am I doing here? What is going on? And uh, Pastor Derek, there were so many times that God used him to minister to my heart and to encourage me to keep pressing on and to keep and to keep following God and and uh, and that it was worth it it was worth whatever the suffering is whatever whatever the the case is it was worth it when we got to serve God when we got to to serve God with it with what he's given to us and and man his words are so true it is so worth it to serve the Lord with our lives it's it's uh, amazing I'm so grateful for all the pastors here who have invested in me and have discipled me over the years Pastor Jim Davis Tim Matthias Tim Warholic, Mike Katz, Jerry Camacho, and Barry Andrioli. You guys have all been a true example of not only what a leader is, but what a, a, a good husband is, a good father. And uh, um, you guys have discipled and, and mentored me in so many ways. And, and uh, I'm going to be forever grateful for that. So grateful for the staff I work with. They, they really are the best ministry staff in the whole world. It's It's amazing. <laughs> grateful for the ministries I'm in. Mean, I always tell Nikki I feel like I'm living the dream. I, I, I get to serve with, with Dulas, which is like the most amazing blessing to be able to serve with each and every one of them and, and uh, uh, gotten to travel around with them as well. And it's been so, so amazing to see what God is doing in and through that ministry and in and through each and every one of their lives. And uh, with the worship ministry, it's amazing. The worship here is just unlike any other. I love worshiping with my brothers and sisters here. Amazingly talented people. I'm very grateful for my family back at home and in California who have supported me even though it was crazy when they first heard that I was moving to Las Vegas. They were like, really? <laughs> uh, when I told you to get plugged into a church, I didn't know if I meant that, but... Um, they were, have been so supportive uh, of me moving and ministering in this city, and uh, they were they wanted to be here, but uh, um, weren't able to to make it tonight. But uh, so grateful for for each of you who have who have supported and invested in me, and and uh, my family here in in Las Vegas for supporting and and investing in me and letting me marry their daughter. Thank you very much for that. And ultimately, uh, you know, as well, I'm, I'm so grateful for my wife, my co-pilot. She has been by my side every, every step of the way. And I love serving the Lord with you. I love, I can't look at you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. I love serving the Lord with you. I can't wait to see what he continues to do in our lives together. It is amazing to serve God with you. It's the biggest blessing in the world. And lastly, uh, you know, God has really laid something on my heart as I was praying about tonight. One of the things he laid on my heart was Second uh, Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, this, this scripture, he really, he, I feel like he really spoke to me. Uh, verse 1 says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. And I pray that for, for me, uh, you know, in, in, as I walk into what God is calling me to do, I pray that I would be a man of his word. I pray that, you know, there's, there's this weird, um, you know, thing that, that's going around where people are drifting away from the inerrant word of God. And they're drifting away from, man, they're, they're, it's, some of it is really good. Some of the, the word of God is true. Some of it's really good. But others, maybe it's not so true. It's more of like, uh, you know, pictorial. It's not, it's, it's more 
more symbolic it's in uh, metaphorical and things like that but man I hope I never get to that point in my life I pray that I would always be a man uh, after God's own heart a man of his word that I would walk in his word every day and that by his word I would fulfill the ministry he has called me to and I pray that you would keep me all accountable for that uh, you guys are my family you guys are are, are all of my my family and, and my brothers and my sisters and I pray that you would keep me accountable to the word of God as well and my encouragement to you maybe uh, maybe you've been wondering what God is calling you in your life maybe you're wondering man what what is God calling me to do in my life what what uh, who am I supposed to marry or who what am I supposed to do with my life what career am I supposed to go to uh, wh where am I supposed to live all of these different things and so it's so easy to to uh, start um, seeking after and pursuing after the call of God instead of seeking after God and pursuing after God. And uh, my encouragement to you all tonight is to fall in love with Jesus, to fall more and more and more and more and more in love with Jesus, to not to not search for the calling of God because his ways are past finding out. They're unsearchable. They, you can't figure them out, but to just seek God because he's God, because he's so, so good to us, because he's the maker of the heavens and the earth. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he has a relationship. He desires a, re a relationship with each and every one of us. He loves us. And so my encouragement is to fall in love with Jesus to fall more in love with Jesus. And in doing that, God's going to reveal the call of, of, of uh, God in your life. He's going to re reveal his calling to you. He's going to, to reveal what you're supposed to do in your life, where you're supposed to live, who you're supposed to marry, what your, your calling is in your life. But the encouragement tonight is fall in love with Jesus. And uh, my last, uh, the last thing that I'm ultimately grateful for is the Lord. I, I am so grateful for God and, and, uh, and for all that he's done in my life, um, you know, for, for just the, the, the way that he has saved me, the way, the things that he has pulled me out of, and uh, um, that he has cap captured my heart. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for the Lord tonight, and tonight uh, it, is, it is for his glory. The, I don't want this, like Derek said, this is not my night, this is God's night. It is always God's night. So to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>Tony mentioned his dad and his mom, and he's, there's an amazing legacy that they've laid down, and um, we wish they could have been here tonight, and uh, it was our hope. It didn't work out. Uh, I know they're watching online tonight, but they also sent a video in. Hey, everyone. This is uh, Tony's dad from Seattle, Washington. Hey, Tony, your ordination uh, service today. Wow, I am so proud of you. Uh, sorry that uh, we weren't able to come today. And I know what everyone's thinking. Uh, yeah, he's at the Seahawks game. Well, I want you to know you're right. No, 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 no. I'm not at the Seahawks game today. Uh, we were just we were, weren't able to, to come today, and and God knows, right? Uh, but uh, I want everyone to know there at Calvary Chapel, Spring Valley, that uh, Tony has always been a person of integrity and uh, a person after God's own heart, and a person with godly character. Except for that time that uh, <laughs> um, Lisa and I, we were gone. Tony was like 16 years old. We were gone for the day. Tony's at home with his sister, and, and he got a phone call, and he's talking on the phone. And, and uh, during this time, uh, we were doing some construction downstairs, some remodeling, and I left my uh, cordless drill downstairs. Well, you know how sometimes when you're on the phone, you start doodling on a piece of paper with a you know pencil or crayons. Well, Tony uh, grabbed that cordless drill. You heard me right, the cordless drill, and he began doodling on the wooden arm of our couch downstairs. And <laughs> he uh, got lost in the conversation and and uh, hung up the phone and and uh, realized, oh crud, I just drilled this artistic pattern, these holes in the arm of my parents' couch. Uh, they're gonna be mad at me. And, <laughs> and so instead of uh, doing the right thing and confessing, 
he proceeded to copy that pattern in the other arm of our couch, thinking that we wouldn't notice. Well, we get home and my wife, with her motherly instincts, immediately notices and uh, calls me downstairs. Joe! I go downstairs. Yeah, w what's wrong? And she says, look at this. I'm like, look at what? Look at the, the, the couch. And so I look at the couch and, and she's like, who did this? And I'm like, I have no idea. And then it occurred to me, I, I do know who did this. <laughs> Tony Monto. And so I was mad. I confronted Tony. Tony, what? Did you do this? And he's, he confessed. He did the right thing. He, he immediately said, yeah, that was me. I'm sorry. But <laughs> all joking aside, that was as tough as it got being Tony's dad. Uh, again, Tony has always been uh, a person after God's own heart uh, with, with high values and, and integrity and character. Um, and I couldn't be more proud. Um, Third John 1 4 uh, says, uh, um, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And Tony, this morning, I want you to know how proud I am of you, Pastor Tony Monto. It sounds natural because that's who God has called you to be. You are uh, a person that everyone loves. If you've known Tony for any amount of time, you immediately know that this guy is the real deal. And and folks, family there at uh, Calvary Chapel, um, I long sometimes to, as Tony's dad, to be with him, to spend time with him. I love spending time with Tony. But what warms my heart in those sometimes difficult times when I'm missing him is to uh, to know that he is down there with his family, his extended family, his beautiful wife, Nikki. Nikki, I love you. We are so proud of you. And he's being cared for by uh, Pastor Derek and, and the body there at Calvary Chapel. You guys, um, I, I, I thank you as his dad for loving my son, for investing in him and being there for him. And, uh, and Tony, uh, I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. Um, you. You are gonna make a great pastor. And I pray for you every day. And I'm praying for you this morning. You are on my heart. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but uh, I love you, son. God bless you. Oh gosh, it's awesome. I'm gonna have the pastors come forward tonight, pastors. Uh, board members and elders, would you guys all come forward tonight? Joe, thank you so much for that. That was awesome. We're going to lay hands on you. I'm glad you did something wrong. <laughs> all right. So normally God chooses, you know, the messed up people, but in your case. All right. We're going to commission you tonight, Tony. And we're calling you to be faithful in your devotion to God, to be a man of the word, to be a man of prayer, to be a man of worship. We're commissioning you tonight to love God's people, to preach the word of God with love and without compromise, to do the work of an evangelist and fulfill the calling of God on your life. You ready to do that? Ready. All right, let's pray. God, we love you so much. We're so thankful for Tony. God, we are overwhelmed tonight. This is a work of your Holy Spirit and... We we're stepping into your work, which leads us to a place, God, where we don't even sometimes know what to say. What can we say, God, except praise you, Lord? Thank you. We glorify you. God, we acknowledge the years of investment that are bearing fruit in this moment right now. We acknowledge tonight your love, your faithfulness, your consistency in Tony's life. God, that you've never failed him, you've never faltered. God, that you are the one who has upheld him. You are the one who has given him the strength to be a man after your own heart, to seek your face. God, you tonight are the one who has blessed the work of his hands and of his heart. You are the one, God, pouring yourself through him 
to touch our young adults and to lead us in worship. And so tonight, Father, we want you to receive all of the glory. Father, you are the one who raised up a mom and dad that were faithful to train up their son in the way he should go. And tonight, what a privilege it is to step into these fields, God, that are so full of fruit, God, that you've been investing in this man's life, and God, that you've invested in Nikki's life, and we're thankful tonight for her family, knowing, God, that they've invested faithfully, and they've poured hours of prayer and love into their daughter, and God, that they have faithfully raised her up in the heart that she has for you, God, it comes from you as well. You are the one who's responsible, and and God, in your timing and in your sovereign way, you've united them together, and here they are as your servants. And tonight, God, we commend them to you. We pray that you'd surround them, be their strong tower of refuge in their time of need. We pray tonight, God, for an anointing on their lives. I pray for Tony. God, please, that, that Father, you would fill him with your Holy Spirit. God, you would anoint the words of his lips and the meditation of his heart. Father, that you would keep in a pl- him in a place of humility and dependence upon you. God, that he would never forget, as, as much as you've preserved his past, God, he would never forget that apart from you, he can do nothing. And without you, he is nothing. And God, as he leans on you and looks to you, we pray for a daily empowering from your Holy Spirit. God, we pray you would deepen him with wisdom God, as he searches you in your word, as he minds your word for truth, we pray, God, that you would bring forth nuggets of truth and wisdom that he would build his life on and share with the people of God. We ask, Lord God, that you would reap a harvest of souls through his life, that as he does the work of an evangelist, that you'd honor the gospel and the power of the gospel through him, and that you would bring many to saving faith through trust in Jesus Christ, your son. Father, we pray that he would be committed to your word and that he'd not waver to the left or to the right. God, he'd not be in in any way induced or tempted to water down your word, but with love he would preach your truth without compromise. And God, as he does, we pray that you would honor the teaching and preaching of your word. We pray, Lord God, that You would be the strong rock that he stands upon. When the wind and the wave come, we pray that you would help Tony and Nikki to look to you, to find their peace in you, to trust in you. Lord God, to lean on you. And we ask as they do, Father, as we commend them to you, as we commission, as we ordain Tony tonight as a pastor here at Calvary Chapel Spring Valley, We ask God for greater things than these. We pray, God, new things for his life, just a season of harvest. We pray, God, that your blessing would be upon them. We commit them and commend them to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Love you, man. Love you, man. Don't go anywhere. This is uh, Tony's certificate of ordination, and so we're going to hand that on over to you tonight, and uh, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that it did not end there, God, but that you rose again on the third day, and we are waiting for your second coming. We are waiting for you to come and to, to gather your church once again to meet you in the clouds on that day. God, we look to you and we ask, Lord, as we are waiting for you, God, that we would serve you all the days of our lives, that we would give you our, our, the gifts and talents that you've given us, the lives that you've given us, God, that we would return them back to you in our act of worship, Lord. We love you, God. We give you this night in Jesus' name. Amen.